and welcome to The Big Hit, everybody. I'm your host, Connor Joyce, and do we have a show for you tonight. First, we're going to talk about the NFL and Adrian Peterson being arrested this week. A very, very long week with his allegations of child abuse. Next, we're going to recap some games this week, including the Steelers' big rivalry loss against the Baltimore Ravens. Then we're going to move on into some MLB. Pirates have a few tough series coming up between the Brewers and Braves. We're going to recap that and what we have our analyst predictions on this week. Next, we're going to talk about the playoff race between the Brewers, Pirates, Ro uh, Royals, and the A's. They each are in tight division races and wild card pennant races. So we're going to recap what we think of this. Next, we're going to move on to college football. We're going to recap some games, especially the South Carolina and Georgia. Big game this week. It was a big thriller. And then we're going to move on and talk about what top 10 teams are the best in our opinions by our analysts. Stay tuned on The Big Hit. Welcome back, everybody, to Red Zone Recap. I'm your host, Connor Joyce. Alongside me is Dakota London and Darnell Turner. Guys, it's been a long week in the NFL, some big games. And first, we want to talk about Adrian Peterson and how he's been arrested this week. It's very unfortunate for the Minnesota Vikings losing a guy like this. He's projected to come back this week. What are your opinions on this matter, and especially with, with Ray Rice just being uh, kicked out of the NFL? Well, um, much like the uh, Ray Rice case, it's an extremely sensitive matter. Especially because, you know, you're dealing with children. And uh, when you're dealing with children, you know, it's a very serious situation. As we all know, he was uh, indicted for, you know, negligence regarding an injury to his child. Um, I think, me personally, it was the biggest concern was, like, how it developed throughout the week. At first, it was, you know, that his child was hit. And, you know, a lot of players took to Twitter about it. Uh, I believe Darnell Dockett and Roddy White were a few. And uh, they expressed their feelings, saying, you know, it, you know, when we were kids, we were, you know, treated that way. But once the picture surfaced of what happened to his child, like the injuries, it became a more serious matter. Then, of course, um, once it became apparent that he had the uh, investigation upon him and the, his uh, mother of his other child, um, there were text messages exchanged between them regarding injuries that his other child faced. So. It's, it's a real serious situation, and um, like I said, it's an extreme sensitive matter. Um, I guess the Minnesota Vikings are handling the only way they know how, but the, you know, with the way the league is going with the whole Ray Rice case and now this, you know, it's, it's, it's a bad week for the NFL right now. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, it is a very sensitive case. Uh, you know, it, when you're dealing with a four-year-old child and, you know, you see, you hear about Adrian Peterson, you know, beating a child, and at first you think, you know, he's just raising his kid. You can't tell him how to raise his kid. But then when you see the pictures, it's, it's just, it's disturbing. And, you know, the NFL, it's been a long week. You have the Ray Rice situation. Now you have this come up. And, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to say what punishment you could give to Adrian Peterson. And, you know, because, you know, it is his kid. You can't tell him how to raise his kids, but at the same time, it's a, it's a four-year-old, and it, it's a very sensitive situation. And, you know, it's, the pictures were disturbing, and yeah, it was it was a very difficult week for Adrian Peterson. Very sad, a veteran player. We're going to move on to recap some games this week, guys. A huge upset: Seattle Seahawks were defeated by the San Diego Chargers with Philip Rivers throwing 284 yards, three touchdowns. What made the Chargers' offense so effective against this great defense? Well, I think the uh, the first thing that uh, stood out when I uh, looked over the game was for one, Philip. He spread the ball around to six different receivers. Um, Antonio Gates, who had a big game, three touchdowns, Eddie Royal, and Keenan Allen all had over 50 yards. So that made me realize that, okay, he's getting the ball around, and he's not, you know, just aiming for one person. The next thing is they attack Richard Sherman, which, you know, the Packers were criticized the previous week for not throwing to his side at least once. 
Um, Sherman had four passes completed against them throughout the game. Uh, I'm not sure of the exact yardage, but I know they, they attacked him. They made it part of their game plan to attack him. And that's probably the, the most evident thing is they had a game plan. They went with their game plan, and it worked out perfectly. And, uh, you know, Keenan Ali even said after the game that he felt that they exposed uh, Richard Sherman by attacking him. I'm not sure if that's necessarily the case. It's kind of early to say that. But they surely were able to move the ball against them. And I think there may be something towards the mismatch between prominent tight ends and attacking their safeties. I know, you know, Earl Thomas is probably the best safety in the league, and Cam Chancellor isn't that far behind. But seven catches for 96 yards and three touchdowns, that's, that's you know, that's not coincidental. Yeah, we haven't seen anybody, any tight end in the league, you know, do what Antonio Gates has did to the Seahawks. You know, the tight end is known for their safeties. You know, they lock up Jimmy Graham, Vernon Davis. You know, they're known for putting the wood on the tight ends. And Antonio Gates had a big game. Phillip Rivers had a good game, no turnovers. You know, coming off a loss at, uh, at Arizona where they felt like they should have won up 17-6 to six in the fourth quarter, and they let that one slip away. And, you know, the time of possession was huge. They held the ball for over 42 minutes. Uh, the defense, Seattle's defense, couldn't get off the couldn't get off the field, and they they played a great game, no turnovers, and they time of possession was huge. Yeah, talking about quarterbacks, Philip Rivers, he had a great week, as I said, 284 yards and three touchdowns. Let's move on to Cam Newton, who uh, just recently came back and had a big defeat over the Lions. He played fantastically. What do you expect of this team now after their success in the past, especially with Cam Newton as a quarterback? Well, I think, I think, you know, the sky's pretty much the limit for you guys. Um, now, I don't think that win was so much of the Panthers as the Lions imploding. If you watch that game, they had a lot of bad turnovers. The best receiver in the game, he dropped a touchdown. So, you know, it was it – was, I mean, they had, they had a good game plan, and, you know, they were really strong with running the ball. But um, with them now being 2-0 and in the South and with the Saints losing – they really, the sky is really the limit for them. They have a very good defense. They have a very good running game. Uh, Calvin Benjamin is really starting to emerge as a very good receiver. So, you know, th there's a lot of potential there. And if they can continue with, you know, running the ball and playing good defense and then passing when necessary, they, they could really be a threat. Yeah, the Panthers are a complete team. You know, coming into the season, after losing Steve Smith, everybody thought their receiving core would struggle a little bit and Cam would struggle without his main receivers. But uh, the defense is still good. You know, they, they dominated the Lions, only giving up seven points to a team that looked like, offensively, looked like nobody was going to stop them in week one against the Giants. Mm -hmm. So the Panthers, the defense is good. Cam Newton played great coming back off the injury. There's no worries there. And, you know, being 2-0 and with the Saints struggling, the Falcons shaky, and, you know, nobody's talking about the Bucks. You know, the Panthers look really good, and the front runners to win this division right now. Yeah, definitely. Panthers are a great team with a great defense. And, guys, we're going to move on here to the Baltimore Ravens and Steelers matchup. Big hometown rivalry. It's been one of the big, best rivalries in football in the last four years. And the Ravens came on top this week. They had a big win at home, especially coming off a big Ray Rice situation at home. Um, they won 26-6. to But we're going to look at the Steelers here, the hometown team. What do you think the main problem is with this team and why they lost this week? Well, I think even coming into the season, one of the biggest concerns for the Steelers was their defense wasn't a playmaking defense. You know, they could hold you to, you know, uh, not that many rushing yards, maybe receiving yards, but they're not a playmaking defense like they used to be. And then if you look at their back end with, you know, Palomalu and even Ike Taylor to some degree, they're, they're not that young. And I think that really becomes a concern because if you wear them down, you can make some plays against them. And if they're not getting turnovers, their defensive line wasn't getting too much pressure, they have their problems with stopping the run, they could, they could be a very shaky defense. And I think that really showed this weekend. Yeah, the Steelers, they just they didn't look into it. And, you know, they, I, didn't, I haven't seen a good quarter from the Steelers since the first half of the Browns game. The second half, the Browns thoroughly outplayed them, and it took a late drive by Big Ben and a field goal to win that game. And coming into they had three turnovers, and that, that doesn't help. They had no big plays in this game, no, no turnovers, no sacks, no touchdowns, only six points. And, you know, they, they weren't disciplined enough. They had nine penalties that were not, uh, accounted for 95 yards, and they just they didn't look good this weekend. Tom, and uh, they have to get that worked out. Yeah, guys, thank you very much. Some great insight by our guys here at The Big Hit. This is going to conclude Red Zone Recap here.
We're going to move on right on along to MLB. Stay tuned with Kyle O'Connor or Kyle Condor. Welcome back to The Big Hit, Kyle Condor here, and we're going to dabble into a little MLB baseball and a predominantly football sh show. To my far left, we have a rookie, Chris Hayes, and to my near left, we have a veteran in Vaughn Dalzell, the two of them matching here. I don't mm -hmm. know if that was planned oh, for it was this, planned. It was this planned. MLB segment, but guys, we have about 12 games left for each team in Major League Baseball, and the playoff races are very tight. Uh, we're going to start with the team right in our backyard, the Pittsburgh Pirates. And the Pittsburgh Pirates took two of three from the Cubs this past weekend. They have three games coming up versus the struggling Boston Red Sox and three games versus the division rival Brewers, who are right on their tail as we head into the playoffs. Guys, what will the Pirates need to do to defeat the Sox coming up these next three games? And ultimately, do you believe they'll win that series? Well, the postseason is two weeks away, and um, it's time to show uh, teams to show what they're worth. And the Pirates are a playoff team, they're a playoff caliber team. They made the playoffs last season. Um, they got a series coming up against the Boston Red Sox. They're not a very good team. They won the World Series last year, haven't been strong this year. I expect the Pirates to take two out of three from this series. They might even sweep. Sweeps are hard to do in, the, in baseball though. The Pirates should take two out of three, I'm predicting, in this series. Um, they got strong starting pitching going this week. They got Charlie Morton, Francisco Liriano, and Garrett Cole, two of their aces going this week. The Pirates should do some damage in this series, I think. Yeah, piggybacking off what you said, Chris, the Pirates are looking a lot better. Their pitching is a lot stronger now than, than it was earlier in the season. And the Red Sox have no pitching. They traded most of their pitching. So it's going to be tough, I think, because the Pirates have been putting hits together a lot. Um, I really think that Harrison's going to win the batting title. So I think that him and McCutcheon are the keys of these series coming up because if they can keep continuing hit and they could put hits together, I think the Pirates would be a very dangerous team. And I think they can sweep the Red Sox and potentially – Still a couple games, two out of three from the Brewers and other teams when they play later on in a couple series these next two weeks. All right, so I think it's safe to say the two of you think the Pirates will continue to do well as the season ends. But now we're going to talk about the aforementioned Milwaukee Brewers, who are a game and a half behind the Pirates for second in the National League wild card. They have a three-game series coming up versus the division-leading Cardinals, who show no signs of slowing down as we wrap up the season. Do you think they'll be able to take a few games from the Cardinals, or will the Cardinals ultimately sweep the Brewers and possibly end their playoff hopes? I'm not saying a sweep. Um, it's going to be a tough series for uh, the Brewers, for sure. They're going to be playing at Busch Stadium at St. Louis. Um, the Brewers are a good team. They're, they were in the first in the division uh, most of the season. They've since uh, kind of fallen off, kind of slid off. But um, they've got strong hitting. They've got Ryan Braun, an MVP uh, candidate for uh, most years. Um, Carlos Gomez is a strong player. They got some good pitching this year. Uh, Giovanni Gallardo is le leading their staff. Uh, but the Cardinals are first in the div division right now, and they don't show any signs of stopping. Um, they're a very strong team. Um, this is going to be a good series. I think the Cardinals take two out of three. I'm not saying a sweep. Sweeps are hard to do. I'm saying two out of three for St. Louis here. Yeah, I agree with you. I think Milwaukee's too good of a team to get swept by the Cardinals. They've had a lot of matchups this year together, and they've split a lot of the series. I like Gomez, I like Ryan Braun. When you have two hitters like that, it's hard to really pitch around those guys. So I believe they take two out of three, but I ultimately think that St. Louis will take this division, the NL Central, and I think Milwaukee will finish third behind the Pirates. So that's my prediction for that. All right, sounds good. So it seems like you guys have a pretty set mind mm -hmm. on how the NL Central will shape up at least, but let's head on over to the American League where we have a very tight race in the AL Central between the Kansas City Royals and the Detroit Tigers. The two teams going back and forth all season long. The Royals currently trail the Tigers by a game and a half in that division. Which team do you believe will ultimately win that division title? I'm going to have to go with the, the Detroit Tigers here. Um, they're, a, they're a veteran team, a playoff caliber team every year. The, Ro the Royals are a surprising team this year. Um, they haven't played well at all the past decade or so. But um, this could be their year to make the playoffs. I'm not saying they're going to be the division winners. I'm saying they'll be a wild card team. 
Uh, Detroit, Detroit's just too good with their pitching. Uh, they got David Price in a trade. They have Verlander and Scherzer, two of the best in the game. Um, Detroit's a very good team. And so is Kansas City. Uh, it's going to be a battle for sure. It might go down to the final weekend, actually. But I think Detroit wins this division. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think the pitching is so key in MLB, and I'm such a big fan of pitching. And the addition of David Price really helped them. But Detroit can hit. I mean, they have Cabrera, who is a big home run hitter. Uh, they have Victor Martinez, who has 31 home runs. Him and Cabrera together have 54 home runs. And that top four lineup for Detroit is so strong. And today I looked up their stats, and they have 84 home runs together. And that right there is impressive to me. And I think that's the difference between them and the Royals. Even the Royals are a hit, good hitting team. But I think Detroit will win the division. But I do think the Royals will make the wild card, like you said. Yeah, that would be cool to see the Royals win that division as they haven't won a, a Major League Baseball division since 1985. But guys, let's head out west now and talk a little bit about the Oakland A's who have struggled ever since they traded Yoenna Cespedes. I'm sure you guys have some stuff to say about that. But they took two out of three from the Mariners this past weekend. They're currently in first place in the AL wild card, but that lead is not comfortable. What do you make of the short winning streak the A's had over the Mariners this past weekend? I think it's very important. Um, the A's, if you recall, uh, they were the best team in the whole league uh, most of the season. Um, they've since kind of fallen off. They went on a losing streak after they traded Cespedes. Um, their offense has always not been their strong suit. Um, and then with the trade of Cespedes to get Lester, which John Lester is a very good pitcher, and they've been one of the best pitching staffs in the league. But um, losing Cespedes was a big loss to their already struggling offense. But I think uh, now coming forward to the end of the season, they've been playing some good baseball, they've been winning a lot of games, and they're, they're on that first place in the wild card. I think they're going to hold on to that first spot. Yeah, I agree with you for the most part. Um, once, once they traded Cespedes, they lost a lot. I mean, they were neck and neck with the Angels the whole entire time, and now they're ten and a half back of the Angels. So I think the trade didn't work out as much as they wanted to. Cespedes was a big part of that team. And they have been playing decent baseball lately. I think they will hold on to the wild card, but it's going to be a tight race. And I don't think they can win a wild card game, a wild card game especially if it's on the road with the way they've been playing lately. Because a two, uh, they're on a two-game win streak, and that's just a series right now. They're going to have to pick that up and be better than how they've been playing lately, I believe. Yeah, guys, it should be a, a wild last couple of weeks in Major League Baseball coming up here. But that's all the time we have here to talk MLB. We're going to send it over to Eric Cormos and some of our analysts to talk about the week that was in college football. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Big Hit. I am Eric Cormos alongside Malusi Kitchen and Isak Mohammed. We're here on Red Zone Recap to go around the week that was in NCAA football for week three. On tap tonight, we're going to look at a USC upset in Boston, a couple of blowouts featuring Ohio State and LSU, and then a little discussion about which team is the best as we enter into week four of the football season. But gentlemen, we begin first south of the Mason-Dixon line in the only matchup that featured a pair of top 25 teams this weekend as the number six Georgia Bulldogs went into Bryce Williams Stadium at South Carolina. And South Carolina came out with a 38-36 drama-filled win. So, start down here. Isak, what was the most uh, key, victor key point to the South Carolina victory? In the uh, South Carolina game versus Georgia Bulldogs, I believe that the special teams were a crucial part of the game because Georgia missed a few field goals that helped South Carolina sneak out a victory. And um, I think that they need to help, they need to fix that special team if they want to go far this season. Yeah, um, I think South Carolina actually had a better, they had, their time of possession was actually better. They had 31, they, had, they held the ball for 31 minutes. Uh, Dylan Thompson had an amazing game. He had 30, 21 of 30 completions. I mean, he just had a great game. And the, the fact of the matter is that no one saw South Carolina actually winning this game. Georgia was expected to win this game, but it actually turned out to be a thriller, better than we expected. And the defense, I think, actually showed up for uh, South Carolina. Even though they let up 35 points, they still came through in the end. So I think South Carolina definitely had a, a very, very solid game this week. Yeah, so much for all that hype about the Georgia Bulldogs, right? It seems like every year they're always supposed to be <laughs> yeah. national championship contenders, and there's always a loss that jumps up and gets them at the beginning of the season. All right, gentlemen, we're going to move to Boston now. And we look at USC at Boston College, the biggest upset of the past week in college football. Mm. USC coming off a big win over Stanford. And then the perfect trap game. they got to fly all the way across the country to Boston to play BC. Uh, BC running back Tyler Murphy had an incredible day, dominated the football game, really, 191 yards uh, and a touchdown. 
Uh, what were the keys there? What surprised you the most about the, the BC victory? Was it the BC win itself or a collapse by USC? Uh, it was a combination of, of both. I believe that they, they shouldn't have collapsed that late in the game. And like the running back, John Hillman, he had 89 yards and two touchdowns. And um, Tyler Murphy, you know, he was he just couldn't be stopped. The quarterback running for 191, that's just, it was a great game by him. And uh, they had they had 460, 464 total yards throughout the whole game. That's a lot for the USC defense to allow. I mean, okay. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm more surprised that USC lost. I mean, they're a top-ranked team, and Boston College outrushed USC by 432 yards. I mean, that is just unacceptable for a USC defense. Um, and USC has only allowed 23 points in their first two games. They had 13 in the first game and 10 in the second game. So coming into this game, you would expect the USC defense to have a great game. But that was not the case. Boston College absolutely dominated, like uh, Eric said, with Tyler Murphy. Uh, they just had a phenomenal game. And this really uh, exposed USC's weaknesses on defense because they could not stop the ball, you know, running, passing-wise. It was a field day for uh, Boston College. Yeah, it makes you wonder about USC and their motivation when they get out game by that much on the road. Uh, gentlemen, real quick, a couple blowouts we're going to look at. We're going to begin with number 22, Ohio State, a 66-0 victory over in-state rival Kent State. Nothing really special here, kind of to be expected, but JT Barrett, Ohio State quarterback, remember Braxton Miller out for the season with a shoulder injury, so Barrett has to come in. He went through for six touchdowns and one interception over the victory over the Golden Flashes. So... The question is, has Barrett proved himself to be a better quarterback than Braxton Miller? Uh, no, I don't, I don't believe that he did that. That was only, he was going against a weaker team. The defense wasn't that good. He, he's no Braxton Miller. He can't, he can't uh, throw like him. He's not the leader like him. I mean, he's a freshman, but he, give him some time. He should be consistent eventually. Because six touchdowns, that's tied for Ohio State record, I believe. That's top for the record. So he's doing good, I guess. Yeah, I think uh, JT Barrett had a great start. He, um, he definitely impressed me, even though it was only Kent State. He definitely commanded his team. He commanded that offense well. But I don't think it's enough to say that he should you know, eclipse or take Braxton Miller's spot. Braxton Miller got injured. We all know Braxton Miller was the focal point of that team. He made that team more explosive. He made that team better. And I think JT Barrett still needs to prove himself. Um, even though Ohio State doesn't have that uh, a tough schedule, I think in this coming season he can really prove himself to see if he deserves that spot. Because one game doesn't really prove if you deserve to be the quarterback for that team. You know, it depends on whether he is going to face adversity. You know, how he's going to deal with you know being under pressure, being the captain of that team. So I just think we have to see how it plays out. But I think he's definitely started off very well. All right, and then last game we're going to talk about today before we do a little uh, discussion about next week, LSU. He takes out Louisiana Monroe 31 to nothing. Uh, Anthony Jennings completes 11 of 18 passes, 139 yards, only one interception. So, LSU, are they for real? Uh, I believe that they're solid. Darrell Williams had two touchdowns, so that's good. And I believe in their defense because they still got Jalen Mills at safety leading them. So, I mean, he's, he's going to lead their team this year, and he's going to have to step up to make sure everybody's together so they can finish out the season. But I don't think they're the best at all. Uh, I think LSU, have a, they had a great game, 7-14 uh, on third down efficiency, and that's a big key for them, especially in the, in the uh, conference that they play in. Uh, I don't think they're the best team out there, but I definitely think that you have to watch out for them just because of their, the way they played this week and you know, what they can do within their conference. So I think we just have to wait and see. But as far as I think there, you have to you have to be wary of that team of LSU. All right, gentlemen, last topic for the night. You have teams such as Oklahoma, Alabama, Oregon, Baylor, Texas A&M and LSU all still undefeated as we enter week four in the college football season. Who's going to be left standing uh, in January? I believe Oregon because they have Marcus Mariota and I, I believe he's going to win the Heisman this year. He has the most touchdowns, I believe. The most touchdowns for the school at 71. And he had he threw for for two touchdowns and also ran in for one. 
in this game, and they they got very diverse. They threw, they threw the ball around, and the receivers and running backs, they all got parts of it. They all got nice touchdowns, and they really spread the ball and looked very diverse. Uh, I'm going to have to disagree. I think Alabama is going to be left standing because I like Nick Saban, and I like what he's doing with his defense, and I like how he bounces back, especially after what happened uh, last year, how they ended their season. So I believe in Nick Saban. I believe if they can get their quarterback situation handled out, I think it's going to be able to work out for them because Blake Sims and them definitely have to work out a few things. But I think Alabama is going to be that team to beat. All right, gentlemen. All right, thank you for joining us tonight here on the Red Zone Recap for Isak Mohammed, Lucy Kitchen. I am Eric Cormos. Stay tuned. Want to learn more about IUP TV? We have the solution. IUP TV is now online on Facebook. You can find us by simply searching Facebook for IUP TV. Once you click like, you can check out your favorite shows on our IUP TV showcase, view our broadcast schedule, get updates on everything about your favorite station, and tell us how much you love your favorite shows. IUP TV, not like other stations. Well, Kyle Condor here, and you could add me to the list of injuries following week two of the NFL season. What's my injury, you ask? Like many other fantasy football team owners, I have a headache so significant that I can't even walk straight. But the doctor said it's only going to take me one minute to heal. For A.J. Green, it may take one week. For Jamal Charles, one month. For Charles Tillman, one career. For Adrian Peterson's kids, too soon? But I'm not sure all that news is as shocking as the list of teams that went to week three winless. The Colts, Saints, and Chiefs all made it to the playoffs last season. And this season, all of them have lost their first two games. And since the league expanded to a 12-team playoff format in 1990, only 8% of the teams that started 0-2 rebounded to make the playoffs. Speaking of the playoffs, can you believe there will be such a thing in college football this year? Me either. Now, instead of the third and fourth ranked teams complaining that they didn't get a chance to compete for the title, it will be the fifth and sixth ranked teams. At the moment, those two teams would be Auburn and Texas A&M. But seriously though, is A&M's new quarterback really trademarking the name Kenny Trill? As if Johnny Football wasn't enough. Anyway, let's talk a little baseball. With 12 games remaining, the Angels are six wins away from becoming the first MLB team to win 100 games in a season, since the Phillies did so in 2011. Isn't it crazy what a difference three years can make in the MLB? I mean, the Phillies are 31 wins away from that mark this season. And of the teams that won their division in 2011, only the Tigers are on pace to do so again this season. Though I did say on pace, because the Kansas City Royals only trailed Detroit by one and a half games for the division lead. And if they were able to pull off the comeback, it would be the first time since 1985 the Royals took home a division title. Oh, and by the way, the Royals also won the World Series that year. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. That's all the time I have here. For producers Dimitri George and Dan Wallace and director Danielle Eberly, I'm Kyle Conner. We'll see you next week on The Big Game.